Erev Tov Chavrim, I'm Stephen Ben Noon with Israeli News Live. Those of you that are watching on live stream, I just remind you guys, I'm sure you know by now, that our broadcast as well will be in its entirety on YouTube with the different images on the screen as well. Those of you that watch on YouTube, if you'd like to catch us live, look us up, Stephen Denoon on uh, livestream.com there. You can uh, register. We are getting more and more to where we're doing our broadcast live. Tonight is a powerful message. So let's get right into it here. We are actually, uh, the title of it is The Nations Are Confederate Against Israel. And we are about to go into the Psalm 83, uh, the, the, the Psalm 83, the prophecy that was laid out there of what's happening, what's going on. And you're going to be blown away as we really lay into this, uh, all, all these diff the, the, the different prophetic aspects of Psalm 83, how they've been fulfilling themselves who these countries really are that are confederate against Israel and what has been happening in the background for the last year uh, and even a little bit more than a year, uh, well, actually for the last year, what's been happening in the last year that has actually brought these nations, the modern-day nations of these ancient biblical names together that have brought a confederacy against Israel. I want to first, though, because as I have said already in stating this a couple of times in the last two broadcasts, the intifada that is happening in Israel is very much a key aspect of this whole scenario and what's about to completely unravel all around Israel. So let's look at some of the headlines that are happening there. I'll take you, and by the way, uh, <clears throat> I will also have these, and some of these are already up now on Israeli News Live on Facebook. So you can go look at that. You don't have to be a member of our page. I don't think you do. Uh, to where you can just look up Israeli News Live. I think anyone can look that up and see that. Uh, but anyway, we have uh, three cops were wounded in a stabbing at Jerusalem's Old City uh, over the Shabbat uh, on Israel National News reporting here. It's near the Damascus Gate. The three police officers from the Yasmin Riot Control Unit were wounded this afternoon near Damascus Gate of Jerusalem's Old City. Two of the officers noticed the attacker as he approached them and demanded that he identify himself. Instead of cooperating, the terrorists pulled out a knife and stabbed them. Other officers at a location opened fire on the terrorists and killed him. However, a stray shot also wounded a third uh, Yassim member. The two stabbing victims were taken to Hadassah uh, in Karim Hospital and the describing as being in moderate condition. Uh, I, I, I've seen many of these very uh, security officers there on, on multiple occasions there constantly because I go through the Damascus Gate quite often uh, and uh, very, very serious situation nonetheless. Uh, another, uh, another headline on Israel National News, Palestinians break through the Gaza border fence and enter Israel. Ten of them actually do this. I'll just kind of give you the highlights on this article here. They broke through four. Uh, four of them uh, were, were, were arrested and the rest were returned back uh, to Gaza. It is turmoil, turmoil to say the very least that is ha taking place in uh, Gaza with Hamas and all the different ones that are that are that are protesting over there. There's been several uh, of the uh, uh, Palestinians from this area, the Arab Palestinians there, that have been shot and killed since clashes have uh, escalated there. Uh, there. They have already been firing rockets into Israel. Ashkelon was the latest where a bomb hit there. The Iron Dome also uh, has been intercepting rockets that have been coming in. They've only been sporadic thus far because no doubt Hamas is trying to, to get things all put together before they, they launch their attack. Everything is going to be coordinated. It, but you have to understand, <clears throat> by constantly bringing in the Intifada, the third Intifada that, that uh, Mahmoud Abbas has even called upon, uh, this has got to cause chaos, and this is what they're doing all over Israel. It is a very coordinated effort by the... Arab, Arabs that are living in Israel that call themselves the Palestinians. It is a coordinated effort in order to get Israel totally engaged into an internal conflict and combat. This way, when Israel is attacked on her borders, she's so concerned with the internal problems that she'll be weakened on her borders on the outside. This is what the purpose of this is all, uh, is all about. 
Uh, Israelis are also protesting over security concerns. Demonstrators come out across the country to protest as attempts to murder Jews continue. Following the recent wave of terror, people across the country have come together in protest. On, on Saturday night, hundreds of demonstrators in Haifa called for the government to take immediate action against Arab leaders who either remain silent or continue to incite against Jews. A number of local Arabs tried to approach the protesters, but police kept the two sides separate. Police also prevented Arabs from confronting Jewish protesters in uh, Ramallah, uh, Ramla, excuse me. Uh, three demonstrators were arrested in Afula, including two minors. Arabs tried to attack Jews with Molotov cocktails and rocks without success near uh, 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 Betar Ilet and Hebron today. It's my brothers and sisters in Israel. Let me just say one thing. Protests I can certainly understand, but at this point here, I am concerned that protests may cause things to work in the favor of the terrorists that are, that are attacking the Jewish people. Uh, and when I say that, because this is exactly what the, the, the Intifada wants. They want to create chaos within the Israeli government there, is within the Israeli people there, to where all the security forces, all the military, are, are dealing with the terrorist attacks because they're fixing to launch attacks on the borders of Israel. We are watching Psalm 83. It has been, they have been organizing Psalm 83 for the last year. Remember, Psalm 83 is not the actual war. Psalm 83 starts out with Israel crying out to God, Be thou not silent, O God. And nowhere in the Psalm 83 do we see that God actually intervenes. It's much like Micah chapter 4 in the prophecy there. God promised to return Israel to, to Mount Zion. She's there. She has control of it. That is prophecy that's been fulfilled. But then God says, why are you in travail? Is there no king in thee? See, God allows the pressure to come upon Israel and even the enemies gather all around, but God is bringing our enemies to the threshing floor. But it means that there's a lot of trouble that's upon us. It doesn't mean that we're, no, you know, we're in travail. If we're in travail, there's problems. Psalm 83 is only a confederacy. But I want to share with you tonight uh, several things before we get into the Psalm 83 and really break some of this down of who these people are, these biblical countries and who they are today. Let me share with you one other thing. I made the statement that in the title of the video uh, earlier that Hezbollah is ready to attack Israel. They are. They are part of the Psalm 83 Confederacy. They said themselves, Nasara, the leader of Hezbollah, stated back in January when he retaliated and killed the Israelis in the tank that was on the northern border of Israel, he said, we are not ready for a war with you yet. He wasn't ready as of yet. And he goes on to explain because he was fighting ISIS for Syria. And he couldn't handle two fronts at one time. And I made the, I did a news broadcast on that back in uh, late January. And I said, what does he mean by not yet? It shows that he clearly is planning on attacking Israel in the future. And Israel really did practically nothing about what happened afterwards. Of course, they were retaliating because Israel had killed one of their top leaders in, on the Syrian side with a drone attack there and killed uh, an Iranian general and one of the heads of Hezbollah that were was sitting there they were plotting and planning then on how to attack Israel from the Syrian side. All right, so a lot of interesting things are going on. But people, some, some people actually said it was, it was not smart that I titled the video that way, that Hezbollah is not ready to attack Israel. Well, they said they were back in January. And they said they're ready to attack at any time. And they also stated already publicly that they will take the Golan within 24 hours. And... Uh, the defense minister of Israel, Yolan, said that if, if Hamas, excuse me, not Hamas, but if Hezbollah were to attack Israel from the north, they would lose the Golan within the first uh, 48 hours of the battle, and it would take at least 48 hours to regain it back. Now, that's an admission of the Israeli government. They're not prepared to handle Hezbollah on the north. But what else did we have? A precious brother. I forget who it was. I got so many things coming in. Forgive me, brother, for not 
being able to remember your name, but a brother sent me a, uh, a link, or, or excuse me, just sent me a note in, in the comments there and said, you're right on with this, just paraphrasing, you're right on with this. He says, because Hezbollah has been given 75 tanks. 75 tanks? What does Hezbollah need 75 tanks for? Soviet-era tanks. All right, this is on, uh, this article here comes from the Times of Israel. It says, uh, report Syria arming Hezbollah with 75 era tanks. This was here on September 26th of 2015, just a couple of weeks ago. Kuwaiti paper says 100 Ira Iranian soldiers landed in Damascus as Tehran, Moscow, and Hezbollah worked to prop up Assad's regime. All right, the Syrian army has given dozens of Soviet era tanks to the Islamist Hezbollah organization to help battle its enemies, Kuwaiti newspaper uh, Al Rai reported Saturday. Remember what I said to you the other day? Or excuse me, what, uh, what, what uh, President Putin actually said when he was accusing America for arming the terrorist organizations that were fighting in Syria against Assad's regime? He said, you arm them, you give them the weapons. He said, but they don't never give them back, do they? Now, Hezbollah would be on the side of Russia because Hezbollah is for Assad's uh, presidency in Syria. He's for that regime there. So therefore, Russia and Hezbollah would be also uh, in partnership there, just as Iran is in partnership with Russia. Syria is in partnership. They're all there as one. They have, they have a coalition of the forces that are all around Israel. Now, Russia supposedly is an ally of Israel. But Russia is allowing the region to become unstable for Israel. So Russia does not have Israel's back. Is one man that wrote to me and said that they did that's part of the Israeli government. No, they don't. They don't have your back. If anything, what Russia is there for is to make sure the United States does not intervene when Hezbollah strikes on the northern border. Not that, not that Barack Obama could really care less. Barack Obama would just be glad to see it happen, no doubt. All right? But it says here, uh, the newspaper quotes official sources saying that each party will be responsible for particular areas of Syrian and Russia's operating in uh, Latakia, uh, Hama, and some parts of Aleppo province, while Iran will be defending the capital Damascus and, uh, and to uh, Quanatra on the Syrian side of the Golan Heights. The report also states that some 100 Iranian special forces trained in urban warfare have arrived in Damascus. Why do they have Iran on Damascus' side? Think about, friends, what, what, what's happening here. Iran has special forces, a hundred of them, and this is what Kuwait is willing to report. Do you think Kuwait's going to tell you everything? Of course not. They're an Arabic nation as well. Although the United States did liberate them from the Iraqi forces, Kuwait knows that they were only liberated so that the United States could get the oil of Iraq. It's, it's no mystery here, okay? But Iranian forces are going to be around the Damascus area. That's right there on Israel's border. When they take and invade Israel, that'll be Hezbollah from the north, the Iranian soldiers from, uh, from the eastern border of Israel. Russia's not going to get involved. Russia will say that before 1967, this was actually Syrian territory. They're only gaining back what they got or what they had before. And interestingly enough, Nasra, the head of Hezbollah, Hezbollah in Lebanon, had stated that he will take the Golan. Why does he want the Golan? Because it's Syrian or was considered to be Syrian territory. So the whole purpose for all this to begin with is to get control of the oil-rich areas that are there in Israel. And that battle is about to take place. All right. Reading on in the article, Hezbollah will reportedly be taking positions around 
uh, Homs, where the ancient city of uh, Palmyra, now largely decimated by Islamic State, is located. The Syrian army has received substantial support from thousands of fighters dispatched from Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Lebanon, and most notably, fellow Iranian client Hezbollah. Meanwhile, the Israel Defense Forces has been preparing for a possible ground operation on the Syrian side of the Golan in the event sustained rocket strikes or coordinated terror attacks against Israel, either by Sunni jihadists or Hezbollah. You see, so for someone to say that, you know, Hezbollah is not ready to attack, Israel is preparing for it, and for good reason. Now, my Jewish brethren, it, let me read this one other, last part of the article here. It says, The number of Islamists flooding into the area close to the border with Israel has the IDF on High Alert Channel 2 reported last month, adding that the military had held a large-scale drill simulating a possible advance into Syria and evacuating of Israeli civilians from the border communities. Evacuating the citizens from the border communities? Friends, it's going to happen. All right, let's, let's take a look at Psalm 83. Psalm 83, I repeat it, and I repeat it again and again and again. Israel is asking in prayer that God would intervene and that God would burn and, and decimate its enemy as it did in, in the sight in the times past of things that God has done then. But we don't see where God actually says that he would. He does not according to Micah, but it only comes after the travailing of Israel. So there's going to be an attack. Let's look at the Confederacy again. It starts out, verse 1, Keep thou not silence, O God, behold not, excuse, excuse, excuse me, O God, hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, that's an uproar, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have a leader, that is Pope Francis of Rome. And you're going to see in just a minute how much he is that leader. It's not Vladimir Putin. I'm, I'm surprised people haven't said that he's the Antichrist yet. I'm sure that's coming. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. The hidden ones are the two witnesses. All right? Crafty counsel against thy people. Do you know in the Hebraic language that crafty counsel is actually, in, a mo in the modern language, used as a... Uh, It'd be like a UN meeting type thing. It's, it's, an, it's an official meeting that they have done. They have said, come let us cut them off from being a nation that the name of Israel may no, be no more in remembrance, for they have consulted together with one consent that they are confederate against thee. The tabernacles of Edom and the Ishmaelites and Moab and the Hagarenes, Gebal and Ammon and Amalek and the Philistines with the inhabitants of Tyre, Asir, Asur, also is joined with them. They have hoping the children of Lot do unto them as unto the Midianites, that is in Sisera, as in Jabin, and the brook of Kison. And then it goes on and on and on where they're asking God's intervention here. It is a confederacy, as the Bible clearly states. All right? It is, they are confederate. Okay? Let's, against thee, so to attack Israel is to attack God. Or at least this is, what, this is what they're saying in prayer. Now God has not spoke on this. We don't see where God says they're confederate against him. They're crying out for God because they know that they're God's people. So if they attack Israel, they believe that by attacking Israel, they're attacking God. And God does say in Micah that he's going to intervene. He said, because they know not, God says, you know not the thoughts of the Lord. All right? They've lifted up their head. Pope Francis is the head of the ones that is making this confederacy. Now, let's examine who these people are, some of them. The tents or the tabernacles of Edom. Edom is Esau, according to Obadiah. And I'm just going to share this with you because I want you guys to understand this clearly, what we are looking at. According to Obadiah, if you look at verse 6, how are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? Obadiah is about Esau. 
Drop down to verse 10. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Interesting, isn't it? By the way, this is a future prophecy. You're going to find out well, I'll take it back. He's actually talking about 70 AD when the temple's being destroyed here, but it goes into a future prophecy as you go down into here. Most people would think, well, wait a minute. I thought in the book of Kings that David killed off all the inhabitants of Esau, all but one. It says he killed off all the males except one, and that was who? Hadad. Hadad, who was a royal seed of Esau, survived, raised in Egypt. Interesting, isn't it? Raised in Egypt. You're going to find out the Egyptians are part of this group here too. He then becomes the king of Syria. Wow. And now God, is a, uh, a, through the prophet Obadiah, is claiming that Esau is actually a Roman. So the Romans, the Syrians, and the Egyptians all related and encircle Israel. Now, so God says... Shame shall cover thee, as thou shalt be cut off forever. In the day that thou stood on the other side, in the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces and foreigners, entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. So Esau wasn't by himself. And even historians say that it was Syrian armies that came in and other uh, Arabic armies that came in that ransacked Jerusalem. But God also accuses Esau of this. Verse 12, but thou shouldest not have looked on the day of thy brother and the day that he became a stranger, neither shouldest thou have uh, rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction, neither shouldest thou have spoken proudly in the day of distress. Thou shouldest not have entered into the gates of my people in the day of thy calamity. Yea, thou shouldest not have looked upon their affliction in the day of their calamity, nor have uh, uh, laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. The Ark of Titus shows clearly that Titus, the Roman general, actually came and took the artifacts from the temple back to Italy. Modern-day Italy, that is, Rome, the Roman Empire. And somewhere under the Vatican, those treasures still are sitting there today. Also, Daniel the prophet clearly identifies the prince that shall come will be of the people who destroyed the temple and the sanctuary, which was Titus, the Roman general. So therefore, that prince that shall come is a Roman in modern days, a future prince, an Antichristo, the Antichrist himself. All right? Now, we may jump back to this in a moment, but let's go back over here to the Confederacy here. Oh, by the way, let me just read. There is one thing that's important here. Uh, also in Obadiah, it speaks of the Confederacy as well. Um, I'll try to come back to that shortly here if I can find it. I don't know if I can find it right now. Let's, let's continue on. So, they have taken crafty counsel against thy hidden ones. They have said, come let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance, for they have consulted together with one consent they are confederate against thee. The tabernacles of Edom, or Esau, which now we have established is the Roman Empire that has reestablished the Catholic Church, Vatican City. Clearly. All right? This is the head there. The tabernacles, or tents in this case here, are the World Council of Churches or the different church leaders around the world that are united with the Vatican. You're going to find out those churches, many of them are Catholic Orthodox churches in Syria, Egypt, and even Lebanon, and Palestinians, or the Arabs that are in Israel that call themselves Palestinians. They're all united with Rome in this thing. Where does then Vladimir Putin come into this? The president of Russia. He also, and of course, guess what? He comes under the tabernacles of Edom, the Russian Orthodox Church. Pope Francis made amends with the Russian Orthodox Church. As well, Vladimir Putin is a Orthodox, uh, Russian Orthodox believer. Another form of Catholicism. And they have already united this. Remember, January, Hezbollah 
says they're not ready to do a battle with Israel yet, showing that they would do it in the future. They intend to take the Golan. Russia comes down for the spoil, the oil in the region. The only reason Hezbollah would not attack the Golan is because they were fighting ISIS. Russia came in to take over that fight. But strangely, Iran comes in with soldiers. China's bringing in soldiers. They got warships off of the coast in the Mediterranean. And they're positioning the Iranians on the border with Syria, with Israel, by Damascus. Hezbollah now no longer has to worry about ISIS because Russia truly is fighting the battle, but they're making it look like that Hezbollah is helping in it and stationing Hezbollah on both sides of the border in Syria and in Lebanon so they can move freely in order to do their advance on Israel. You don't think that Israel won't, or that Russia won't give some air support when they do their ground invasion? Sure they will. Russia will justify it because Assad is their closest ally. They're closer to, a, to uh, Basra Assad in Syria than they are to uh, the president, um, excuse me, the prime minister, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu of Israel. He's got a much closer relationship there because he's Catholic. Now, let's look at the other ones that are listed here. And the Ishmaelites of Moab and the Hagarenes. Who are, the, who are these, the, the Moab and the Hagarenes? This includes Jordan. Moab is part of Jordan, which is also where your Palestinian people come from. They're actually, Palestinians are from the country of Jordan. They're Arabic people. And then the Hagarenes are the Egyptians. Keep this in mind now as I show you who these are. Gibal and Ammon. All right? Gibal is from northern Lebanon. It is Hezbollah is who Gibal is. Am Ammon is from north Jordan. That is from the area where they were from, north Jor Jordanians, which is also, again, where the Arabs that are living in the so-called West Bank, they migrated in from northern Jordan and central Jordan, uh, the two peoples that are there, and that, which, like I said, it was Moab and Ammon, these are what we call the modern-day Palestinians. They are, by the way, um, excuse me, I'm sorry. All right, so let's go on from there. And Amalek, all right, who is Amalek? See, Amalek is also believed to be, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, A Amalek Amalek is actually more from, uh, is, some people believe is part of Esau's descendants. It's hard to say because we see clearly in Obadiah that Esau is actually in Rome. So I have to kind of skip that one there. But the Philistines are the people of Gaza, Hamas, still the remnants of the Philistines of, mod, uh, of today in, in the modern day. Tyre, or Tyre, is also South Lebanon. Again, that's the southern Lebanon. The earlier one that I mentioned to you um, is Gibal. Gibal is from northern Lebanon, but Tyre is from southern Lebanon. All Hezbollah fighters. All right? Assyria has also joined with them. Or Assur also has joined with them. That's Syria. All right? So all of the different Arabic nations are confederate with Esau and the churches that have joined with him, which Russian Orthodox Church is one of those tents or tabernacles that have joined with him. And they've got the support, spiritually speaking and, and politically speaking, from the Presbyterian Church that's joined with them, the World Council of Churches that have joined in with them in the fight to what do they want to do. Like, like former President Jimmy Carter, he is very much for the quote-unquote Palestinians. All right? Let me show you some things here. I said to you a day or so ago, Vladimir Putin meets with Pope, Pope Francis back in June, right? This is the tense uh, that, that are meeting there. Now, let me share with you some more things, though, that you may not be aware of. Did a little bit more research on this. Pope Francis also was receiving the Syrian Orthodox Patriarch, and this was according to Vatican Radio, on June 17th through the 20th, he was going to have him in. He actually meets with the Syrian patriarch, which is like the Catholic 
the head of the Catholic type religion in Syria. He's meeting with him. This, this was on an article here, on, like I said, it's from Vatican Radio. Uh, it says here, let's see, what was the, let's see if I can find the date of this article here. Um, I believe this happened in 2014. Uh, from, from June 17th to the 20th, more and more Egonatis uh, Afrim, the second Syrian Orthodox Patriarch of Antioch and all the East will be in Rome to meet with Pope Francis. Afrim the second was elected in 123 Sir, uh, Syrian Orthodox Patriarch of Antioch in 2014. Okay, no, it was in 2015 that he actually met with him there. All right? That's the Syrian religious leader. Let's move over to Egypt. What do we have happen with Egypt? According to Yahoo News, uh, and this here, uh, let's see here, was on November 24th, 2014. That's actually the earliest time when he started building the alliance here. Egyptian leader meets Pope Italian Premier. According to this here, Vatican City AP, Pope Francis and the Egyptian president exchanged warm greetings during a private meeting Monday in which the pontiff emphasized Egypt's role in establishing peace in the Middle East. Interesting, isn't it? Francis and Abdel Fattah el-Sisi met for about 20 minutes at the Vatican on el-Sisi's first visit to Europe since taking office in June. Francis shook el-Sisi's hand, declaring his happiness at meeting the Egyptian leader. While el-Sisi uh, el expressed through a translator his pleasure at meeting the great man that you are. Interesting, isn't it? Doesn't end there. Lebanon. Let's look what the Pope did here in the different meetings that he had there. This is according to the Daily Star on February the 6th of 2015. He continues to build the alliance. Lebanon, Maronite Patriarch meets Pope Francis in the Vatican. They don't go into any details about the meeting. They just simply said that he met him. All right? Gets more interesting. Then he takes... On October the 3rd of 2015, only days ago, the Lebanese security chief meets Pope at the Vatican. Why is the Lebanese security chief meeting the Pope at the Vatican only a week ago? Interesting, isn't it? See, Pope Francis Saturday met with General Secretary Head Major General Abbas Abrahim in Vatican, a statement issued by the directorate said, Then we move on. Let's go back to Egypt again. Remember, he actually had, he received uh, the Egyptian, uh, Pope Francis, the, 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 uh, the, the, the president or prime minister of, of Egypt, Abdel Fattah el-Sisi. He met with him back in November of 2014. Then the Pope ends up meeting with the, with the uh, Coptic Orthodox Patriarch. And this was in May of this year. And he sent a letter to the Coptic Orthodox Church. Pope, I'm sorry, he didn't meet with him. As a, yeah, he did meet with him, but it wasn't at that point there. Pope Francis said in advance towards the reconciliations are strengthening by the martyrs and that Christians must unite to confront shared global challenges. You see, the Pope of Rome has been building a special relationship with not only the religious leaders of Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, and the so-called Palestinians. Remember, he also recently made or, or designated a saint of one of the so-called Palestinians. So he's dealt with four different peoples there. And of course, Gaza and Hamas, even though they're a different people, they're still unified together as one, considered one nation at this point now, now that the Vatican has declared them as a state already. So the Vatican has declared them as a state. Now what the Vatican has to do is to bring Israel grappled into this war. This is what Psalm 83 has been about. It's a confederacy against Israel. But Micah is the one that shows that they're going to do the attack. Now, just quickly, drop back to Obadiah again. In verse 15, it says, For the day of the Lord is near upon all the, all the nations. As thou hast done, it shall be done unto thee. Thy reward shall return upon thine own head. Remember, 
back in 70 AD, because this is what God is saying, that he's going to return the judgment. Because back in 70 AD, these were some of the same very people that fought against the Jewish people 2,000 years ago and destroyed the temple. Titus was aligned with Syrians. He was aligned with modern-day Hezbollah. He was aligned with, with the Jordanians. All these people that are united against Israel. And I don't know, maybe somebody can tell me whether or not the Egyptians were involved in that ransacking or not. I'm not sure about that. He says, For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the heathen drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and they shall swallow down, and they shall be as though they had not been. When he says, you have drunk, it's masculine plural in the Hebrew, uh, masculine plural. The Pope, when he came in uh, Passover 2014, it was men only that did the first communion. Then all the nations, it was gender inclusive, which is gender inclusive in the plural. They have been doing their communions ever since in the upper room, but they also did it in the tomb of David, letting, the, letting Israel know that he was, in fact, sitting on the seat or the so-called throne of David, which is really not a throne of David, but Israel did give him an official seat at King David's tomb. But then he goes on to say, but upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob uh, shall possess their possessions. God's going to deliver Israel. So just go ahead and bring it on. Micah says God will bring you down to the threshing floor. Then he goes on to say, and the house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame, and the house of Esau for stubble, and they shall kindle in them and devour them, and there shall not be any remaining of the house of Esau, for the Lord hath spoken it. And they of the south shall possess the mount of Esau, and they of the plain the Philistines, and they shall possess the fields of the Ephraim, and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. And the captives of this host of the children of Israel shall possess that of the Canaanites, and even of the Zarephath, Zarephath and the captivity of Jerusalem, which is in Sepharad shall possess the cities of the south, and saviors, or deliverers, shall come up on Mount Zion to judge the mount of Esau, and the kingdom shall be the Lord's. Those deliverers are the two witnesses. King James says saviors. There's your two witnesses. I believe they will arrive very soon, right after the attack, no doubt. Israel is about to be attacked. If you've ever prayed for the people of Israel, if you've ever prayed and asked God to send His two witnesses on the scene, this is the hour. This is the time that you need to pray for them. They are confederate. I, I trust that this has helped you to see how serious this hour is. We know by looking at the news it's really bad. As I said to you again, remember, Moab. See? Moab is central, um, central Jordan, which are where the Palestinians come from. All right? The Hagarenes are the Egyptians. You've already seen the alliance that the Pope has with the Egyptians, both with the leader of Egypt now, as well as the Coptic uh, priest over there, or the Coptic Pope they call him. Gibal is Hezbollah in the north, which also, he's, he's confederate with the religious uh, uh, head there of, of Lebanon, and recently, on October the 3rd, he brings in uh, the, uh, what was that? Let's go back and find that real quick again. I want to see who it was that he brought in. This is when he brings in um, Lebanon, he actually met with the chief security uh, meets Pope at the Vatican, Lebanese chief security. That is the general security head, Major General Abbas Ibrahim at the Vatican. They're getting ready for the war. All right? The Hagarines, Egyptians, Gibal, Hezbollah, Ammon, North Jordan, where the Palestinians also come from as well. Philistines, Amalek, 
I can't really say how that would play into this case here. God knows. There's something to do with that. There's, that also, by the way, includes part of the Sinai Peninsula. Uh, that also includes parts of Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia could have some forces there that come along in this battle as well. The Philistines, clearly Hamas in Gaza. Tyre is South Lebanon, truly Hezbollah's fighters there. And Assur, which is Assyria, has joined with them. I've showed you how each and every one of these have a direct relationship with the Vatican of Rome. The tents, the tabernacles, or the churches, that includes Russia. The Russian Orthodox Church and the relationship that was regalvanized with Pope Francis with the Russian uh, leader of the Russian Orthodox Church and, of course, in June of this year, also President Vladimir Putin also joined up with the Vatican. My friend, Psalm 83 has been fulfilling over the last year, maybe even longer than that. But over the last year, they've been preparing it. Now they're ready for the battle. Is Gog of Magog, I appreciate some of you guys say, it's not Gog and Magog. I, I do know that. I do understand it. It's just, I say Gog and Magog because of the, the way my brain thinks. But yes, is that something that's about to take place, transpire? If it's a compound meaning, then yes, it may be. But clearly, too, the Gog battle, also in Revelation, according to John, is fought at the end of the millennium. But I also believe it could be a compound fulfillment. Clearly, nonetheless, these nations of Psalm 83, Micah's prophecy, many other prophecies that we see in the Bible there are about to be fulfilled. But it also brings about God's deliverance for Israel. But he also expects us to pray for them. Pray for the two witnesses to come on the scene. It's time.